I just want to say a few things because my wife always wants me to promote. Uh, I do not like to promote things, but since we don't sell, I know you will. Since we don't sell things, I feel okay about it. These comic books, which are laying around, I guess you all have them. Uh, you may already know this. I, I drew this comic book when I was uh, originally when I was 19. Um, these pictures were redrawn more recently, but uh, like I don't know when, like in the 1980s, I think I drew these pictures. But um, this is a discipleship manual that I put together because in the Jesus movement in the 70s, I was uh, traveling around with a, with a Christian evangelistic band and. Uh, at the end of every gig, we would I'd give a, you know, a sermon and, and an altar call. And when people come forward, I would take them into a side room and kind of give them some basic understanding of what it means to become a Christian. And I knew I wasn't probably going to see them again because I was moving to the next location. I remember thinking, I wish I had something that I could just hand them that says all this stuff. And so a little later, then, I went to Germany um, with a small team and was teaching there. But... In my spare time, I drew this, not this one, yes, it was this one. I drew four comic books. I think this is the one I drew first. And, uh, but as I say, it's been redrawn since then. But it's, uh, we get a lot of people saying they've learned a lot from this comic book. It's, it's all Bible study. Uh, it, they're used a lot in prisons. Uh, you know, uh, Tex Watson was one of the Charles Manson uh, guys who got, went, went away for life. He's still in prison, but he got converted in prison and he used to order, he was part of a church in prison, had about 300 people. He ordered these by the, by the cartons from us. But um, anyway, these are not bad for discipling young people, like if you have a young people's Bible study group, because uh, there's a lot of scripture in it. Every page has a lot of scripture and you, as you can see. Now, we don't sell these. Um, in fact, you can download them free off, off the website, but um, we'll also send them to people for free if they need some quantities. Uh, there'd be limits to how much we can afford, but that's, we haven't found those limits yet. So, um, anyway, that. Then, many of you, I'm sure, maybe all of you are aware of um, The Empire of the Risen Sun, two books. This is the second book. We don't have the first book, but we do have this, which is both books. Uh, they, they're available as separate volumes, as they have been from the beginning. And then uh, subsequently, I, I wanted to put them both out in a single volume, so this has both, both books in it. And my wife, of course, drew the front cover. She was an art professor for 40 years. Uh, now retired. And then uh, the book on the three views of hell, I'm sure that you know about that book. Uh, that, that came out, I remember, uh, 2013. This is the new one called Why Not Full Preterism. This just came out a few months ago. Uh, Dana also did the cover for this, which I am very pleased with. I like this cover. Um, it's getting uh, mostly critical reviews from the full preterists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the historical <laughs> that's, Yeah, that's the view that Jesus came back already. The full, the full preterist is a view that Jesus came back already, and in 70 AD, so I wrote against that book. I wrote oh. against that book. Yeah, and so uh, full preterists do not like to be uh, disagreed with, although about 99.9999% of all Christians who ever lived do disagree with them, but they, uh, they act as if everyone else is the one who is unreasonable. And uh, so it, when the book came out, I noticed that there was a, a full preterist Facebook page that was already reviewing the book, but no one had read it yet. And there are all, all these comments about how weak the arguments were and, and how uh, one of them said that I was, uh, I don't know, calling names to, uh, you know, calling people names. And, and, uh, and the person hadn't read the book. And there are no names, there's no name calling in the book. I mean, it, it, all the reviews clearly were unrelated to the contents of the book. But I wasn't surprised because... Uh, I don't know if there's any full predators here. If so, and no offense, but full predators do not know how to think critically, in my opinion. And I say that as one who debated back in 2013, Don Preston, who's like the, they call him the debatesman of the movement. He's, he debates, he's the big guns, and 
And most people think he beat me, and maybe he did. I don't know. I didn't go there to win. I went there to, to debate. Uh, but uh, anyway, he, he and I were kind of friendly to each other in the debate. But, but uh, he's, uh, he, he's, he's one of the smarter ones. But he still doesn't execute scripture very honestly, in my opinion. That's my, that's my take. Anyway, we're not selling these books. You know, if we were ordinary... If I was an ordinary preacher, I'd have my life in the back of the table of books, selling books and stuff like that. I don't believe in that, of course. And we can't, you can't buy books from me. But we want you to be aware that they exist in case any of them will be useful to you. You have to get them on your own somewhere. <laughs> anyway, it sells them. Um, and, you know, if you can't afford them, you can write them. We'll send them to you free. But we have a limited stock ourselves. Of course, we buy them. We pray, and then I'm just going to let anyone who wants you know, raise their hand and ask a question. We'll, we'll do that until we're done. And I, I think we I think we figured the church is available until 8.30, is that what I heard? Yeah. Until yeah. about 8.30? Yeah. Okay. So we've got about an hour and a half I left. All right. But it's it's a really a blessing to my wife and me that you guys have all come out. Um, this is actually, believe it or not, this is actually a pretty large group for us. Uh, we don't, you know, if Hank Andrew was in town, they'd be the rent of auditorium. But usually I can hold meetings of my listeners in a living room. And uh, sometimes there's you know, a dozen or less. So it's great to see this many here. Uh, we never know how many listeners we have in an area. <coughs> we have a meeting. Okay. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be with these wonderful friends. And I pray, Father, that the, the desires of their hearts will be met as they have come out tonight for fellowship, for, for uh, no doubt for teaching, uh, just to be in the presence of people who, uh, who think like they do and who desire to follow you and desire to pursue truth and, and uh, all, all the, and your kingdom. I pray, Father, that as we have this interaction tonight, that questions that need to be answered will be answered and connections that need to be made for fellowship will be made and that this will be a, a time of really meeting some needs of each person here and uh, that you would accomplish what you desire from this evening's uh, proceedings. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, anyone have a first question? Yes, Dwight. Um, I uh, have it read your book on hell yet. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I've heard uh, your views somewhat and read somewhat, but, and I'm, I'm not sure I, you know, uh, agree that there's two other options other than the traditional. I'm, I'm not settled on that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when you have someone who commits suicide, and they don't have any indication of them knowing the Lord. Yeah. Apart from what that book says, I'm just imagining that that wasn't here. I know, because sometimes you seem to direct them towards that book. Yeah. Apart from that, what would, is there some way you can, uh, what, how would you talk to them and help them? <laughs> you mean the survivors? The, obviously, yeah, yeah, the survivors, yeah. Well, I wouldn't give a false hope, uh, but I also wouldn't want to <clears throat> explain or describe graphically the flames of hell. <laughs> it's just somebody who's lost a little bit. I actually don't know what hell is like. Um, it's unpleasant. It's tormenting. It is someplace nobody ever wants to go, according to Jesus. Um, but. As far as what is accomplished there, how long people are there, that's what is kind of up in the air. And there, uh, there are two other views besides the traditional view that have been in the church for the first 400 years. Um, and all of them were championed by leading church followers. Uh, the idea that hell is a place of annihilation was taught by Irenaeus, who studied under Polycarp, who said under the Apostle John, and Irenaeus wrote books against heresies, um, and, and his works are among the most 
respected of the church fathers. He, uh, he held the annihilation view, apparently. Um, another church father in origin, who was later anathematized by the Catholic Church, but so is Luther, and so is John Huss, and other people that are not really all that bad. Um, he, he was the most influential theologian for 200 years after his time, in, in the 3rd century to the 5th century. Um, more Christians followed Origen's views than any other that we know of. And, and he held that hell is a place where the, the dead are rehabilitated, they're brought to repentance. Uh, then there was Tertullian, around the same time, and about a similar stature, who believed that hell is a place of eternal, con eternal conscious torment. So, <clears throat> these views have been in the church, taught by leading church fathers since the earliest days, at least since the second century, and uh, we don't know what church fathers in the first century thought of. But, you know, it's their right, it's the apostles' writings that are in dispute. All these views actually do take the whole of scripture into account, but they have a different paradigm that they, trans that they interpret different things through. Um, the real issue with the hell question is <clears throat> what is God's character like? Because hell is nothing else but what God wants it to be. Now, I remember C.H. Spurgeon said, you know, God takes no pleasure in the, in the damned, you know, going to hell and so forth. And I, I'm sure he doesn't, but, but we have to say that God knew from the beginning that some people would go there and he's the one who created them to be whatever it is. I mean, there was nothing here before God created things. So <clears throat> it's not as if God was had somebody above him saying, like it or not, you've got to make hell. You know, uh, Obviously, hell was going to be something that God had a purpose for. The real question is, what is the purpose of hell? The problem with the traditional view, and that is that hell is a place of eternal conscious torment, and that never ever ends, is that it doesn't accomplish anything. Uh, the only thing that is served, since no one is redeemed from it, and no one, it never ends, you know, um, the only thing it accomplished is God's eternal vengeance being poured out on creatures that are, you know, less significant than bugs to him, but he still hates them so much that he can't, you know, kill him's not good enough for him. I mean, it's, it's too good for him. That, the idea is, in the traditional view, that God actually keeps sinners alive forever in hell so he can further torment them. Now, <clears throat> I mean, if God's like that, then he's entitled to be like that, but it doesn't sound like the kind of way God describes himself. And the Old Testament frequently says he does not keep his wrath forever. You know, and he says it repeatedly, and that he's slow to wrath, plenty of mercy. He does not always chide. He won't keep his anger forever. And... Also, the Bible says he is love, and while, you know, there may be Calvinists here, but Calvinists believe that God is love to the elect, but they believe that to the non-elect, you know, he doesn't really love them. He, I mean, if he did, he wouldn't torture them forever. And if someone says, but he has no choice. No, God has choices. He's sovereign. God could do whatever he wants to. If, if someone says, but he couldn't help but lose something because of free will. Okay. Well, he did Free will does mean that some people probably are lost, that, that God didn't want to see lost, but it was still his to decide what would happen to them. In other words, if I'm a king, and I can make all the laws, and I know there's going to be some people who are my enemies, I get to decide what kind of punishment my enemies will be subject to if I catch them and convict them of their crimes. Now, I could torture them forever and ever, if I'm a certain kind of a person, but not the kind of person we call a Christian, you know, when we're told to love our enemies and do good to those who persecute us and bless those who curse us, so that we will be like our Father in heaven, Jesus said, uh, if, if, the, the suggestion that Jesus made is that God, just like it says in the Old Testament, loves people, has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Uh, you know, he doesn't keep his anger forever. And therefore, if we suggest that God does that, we may be we may be slandering him unless he really is that way. Now if he really is that way, then he's a God who's not very much like Jesus because the people who cursed and crucified Jesus and Father forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, Jesus didn't have any animosity toward those who killed him or toward the sinners. Uh, <clears throat> he was known to be a friend of sinners. That's what the Jews hate. That's why they crucified him, because they hated the fact that he was a friend of sinners. Like his father. God so loved the world that he sent his son. Uh, 
So, I mean, God loves sinners. He's, he's the best friend sinners have. Um, and yet, I, and I believed the traditional view of, for many, many years. I mean, I was in the ministry for probably 25 years before I even considered that anything other than the traditional view would even have the slightest biblical merit. Uh, and I hadn't studied other views. So I just I just figured I know some verses that teach eternal conscious torment. They're all in Revelation, but uh, which isn't, I mean, Revelation is something, but it's very symbolic, so it's hard to think that the most objectionable doctrine ever put forward by Christianity is taught only in some verses in the most symbolic book in the Bible and nowhere else. And, you know, that, that raised suspicions in my mind for the first time when I began to hear there are scriptures for the other views, too. Now, one thing that I hadn't really thought through very well when I was held the traditional view is that I always believed that every sinner, if they would repent in their dying breath, God would happily forgive them. Because Jesus died for them, He loves them. If they'll just, he, if He just get them to repent before they breathe their last breath, yay, God wins, you know. But if they get past that dying breath and they die and they haven't said, suddenly God hates them. He doesn't love them anymore. I don't know what they did different, but suddenly He's changed. You know, they, all they did different is die, but He's changed immeasurably because He desperately loved them and wanted them saved until one day. But afterwards, he just wants to keep them alive forever so he can torment them, which isn't a very, not the same attitude. So, I mean, obviously, if God does that, then God experiences a tremendous change in his character when a person dies. Uh, so, there are reasons to question that doctrine, if only on the basis of the character of God. Now, what I have found is, and, and what I bring out in my book, is that there are, there's a tremendous case biblically, for each of the views. Uh, but the, the, the weakest case, in my opinion, is for the traditional view. And that's simply from saying, how many scriptures are there that point that direction? What do they actually say? And there are about five verses in the New Testament, and none in the Old, that suggest that sinners perhaps are tormented forever and ever in hell. That's not very many verses for such a counterintuitive doctrine I mean, most Christians, including the ones who believe it, thank you, um, they say it doesn't seem very just. I mean, that a person would sin for a finite number of years, a blink of an eye to God, you know, 70 years, 100 years, I mean, that's just a, like that. And they, they spend that long sinning, and then God tortures them for infinite time, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. After 20,000 billion years, they're just getting warmed up. You know, because it's going to go on for infinitely more than that. And, and this is what people deserve for a, a, a flash of a lifetime, a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. That vapor of rebellion suddenly warrants all this. Now, when I believed in this traditional view, I, I knew all the answers to those objections. The answer was, well, it, you know, sinning against God is an infinite crime because God's an, of infinite majesty. And therefore, infinite punishment is deserved. Yeah, but the Bible doesn't teach that at all. That's, that's human reasoning. That's, that's not really found in the Bible. That, that, that reasoning is not found. The truth is, whenever the Bible talks about the wages of sin, it says the wages of sin is death. It never says the wages of sin is eternal life and torment. When God warned Adam, he don't sin, he said, the day you're going to die. He didn't mention, you'll only wish you could, but you won't. You'll live forever in torment, wishing you could die, but you won't. He said, you'll die. In Ezekiel, it says the soul that sins will die. Paul said the wages of sin is death. Uh, I mean, even the lake of fire is said to be the second death. So there's that other view that holds that really the wages of sin is not eternal life with torment, but is perhaps a, a, a finite period of punishment followed by ex extinction, you know, annihilation. That is... Each person has a different amount of guilt. And in any court, in any land, penalties are dished out according to the crime. In fact, everything in the Bible that says there's a judgment says people will be rewarded according to their works uh, and, and different rewards. Well, Jesus said it'll be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for Capernaum because Capernaum had more opportunities 
they both rejected Christ and both are tormented, but not one worse than others. And uh, there's that passage in Luke about you know a certain being beat with few stripes or being beat with many stripes. There's proportionate punishment. By the way, if the argument of the traditional view that every sin is against an infinite God and therefore is infinitely culpable, then there couldn't be distinctions in culpability. There couldn't be distinctions in punishment because every sin, even the smallest, is against an infinite God and therefore the punishment due is infinite. And there's, you know, whether you, whether you, whether you're a Charles Manson or whether you're, uh, you know, a Mormon grandmother who just never accepted Jesus properly. You know, that's all the same. You're all sinned against an infinite God. You all deserve the same blistering heat for all eternity. And yet the Bible indicates that not everyone gets the same punishment. There's a distinction. And so the second view, and this was held by Irenaeus apparently. I say apparently because he, he said things that sounded like he meant that. For example, he said that unbelievers will be deprived of eternal existence. Um, which means they won't be in anywhere for eternity. But uh, the view is that sinners will be proportionately punished after the judgment. Some more, some less. Whatever is just, whatever is deserved. And then their candle is put out. They're gone. They're, they don't exist anymore. And that's death. And that's the second death. So that's how another view holds it. Now this seems to be kind of what the Bible teaches uh, in a verse like John 3.16 and similar ones which says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will what? Will not perish which in the Greek is the word means be destroyed but they'll have everlasting life so everlasting life is a conditional result of believing if you don't believe you don't have eternal life those who believe in him will not perish. Apparently those who don't believe will perish. But those who believe in him will have eternal life. So immortality then becomes uh, a, a, the gift of God. And like the Bible says, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It says in 1 Timothy 6, 16 that uh, God alone, or Christ, he might be speaking of Christ, but he says who alone possesses immortality. That word alone is emphatic. He's saying, we don't possess immortality. We're not innately immortal. Adam and Eve were not innately immortal. They had to eat of the tree of life if they were to live forever. And when they were cut off from the tree of life, they ate and died. And uh, so they were made mortal, but potentially immortal if they would eat the tree of life. Humans are not immortal. Only God possesses immortality. And in Romans chapter 2, Paul speaks about those who seek for immortality will receive immortality eternal life. So, uh, you know, the, the second view is called conditional immortality, or what, what we might call annihilationism, is actually the technical term is conditional immortality. That people are not immortal unless they meet the condition of faith in Christ. Christ alone is immortal. If we are found in Him, we share in His immortality, in His, his eternal life. It says in 1 John 5, 11 and 12, that this is the message that God has given to us Christians, eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that has the son has life. He that has not the son doesn't have it. So that Christians have eternal life because that's the gift of God to those who believe in who are in Christ. Those who are not in Christ don't have eternal life and uh, are not immortal. So that's the second view. And there's a lot. I mean, frankly, there's a, there's a lot there. And, and the thing about it is, if you just compare that with the first view, is it... it not only how many scriptures there are about it, there's, there's more scriptures that seem to support the condition of mortality than there are that support the idea of uh, eternal conscious torment. But um, besides the scriptures, just the whole Christian concept that it's just. I mean, it, it says everyone gets a just penalty for what they have done. God knows what's just, but not everyone deserves the same thing. And, and, and the wages of sin after they've been punished is, is uh, you know, the end of their life. But another thing that's great about this view, and I, when I say great about it, we don't choose views because they seem great to us, but, but it fits uh, the idea that God is going to eliminate sin from the universe. Traditionalists who hold the traditional view of, of hell, they believe that sinners in hell will continue to curse God and hate God for eternity. 
which is, they say, that's why it is just to keep punishing them for eternity. It's not so much the sins they committed in this life alone, but that they keep sinning, that they keep hating God, they keep cursing God in hell forever, so that their punishment is going on forever because they're continuing to sin. But then, if that's true, then God never has eliminated sin from the universe. There's going to be sinning forever and ever and ever and ever in some corner. Maybe, maybe it'll be marginalized where we're not going to, we'll be partying over here with God, and over here there's all these people in this torture chamber, and we're not mindful of them, but they're still there, and sin has never stopped. God has never conquered sin finally. Um, whereas with annihilation or conditional mortality, those who are not given the gift of eternal life, they disappear. They, they don't sin anymore. There, there's now a universe free from sin forever. And But the third view, which was Origen's view, is that God wants everyone to be saved. And no creature that he's created can thwart his purpose. If he wants everyone saved, why can't he save them? Well, we say, well, because of free choice. People don't want to be saved, some of them. Right at the moment, they don't. There was a time when many of you didn't want to be saved, too. But you changed your mind. You repented. That's what, that's what repentance is, changing your mind. There's a world full of people who don't want to be saved right now. We were, some of us were them. But it is possible for them to change their mind. Now, how did you change your mind? Well, by the grace of God. I mean, God sent His Holy Spirit to convict. He opened your eyes so you weren't blind anymore. You could see Christ for who He was, perhaps, and, uh, and your heart was opened. Uh, it may be that you went through hell of some kind. Some people get saved during a horrible divorce or, or you know, when they go through bankruptcy or some other horrible, <coughs> hard time they come to God, maybe in prison. But the thing is, the dealings of God in your life brought you to Christ. The, the third view, the origin, origin's view, is that who says God can't keep dealing with people after they die? Now someone say, well, it doesn't say in the Bible that he does. True, it doesn't. It also doesn't say that he doesn't. So in the, in the absence of any information about whether he does or not, the question is, what would please God most? Because hell is whatever pleases him. He made it just the way he wanted it because no one was twisting God's arm and saying, you have to make hell this way, even if you don't like it. No, God's sovereign. He made hell to be what he wants it to be. <coughs> now, obviously, I was mentioning the character of God. If God wants hell to be a place where his enemies are tortured forever and ever so that they never forget how much he hates them and their, their sin, well, then, that's, that says something about the character of God. We would never think that a man who did that to his enemies was even a, a slightly good man, much less a Christ man. But... But, but we have to just accept that God's that way if he is. The question is, is that really what the Bible teaches about God? Now, if he annihilates sinners after they've been properly punished, then he's at least a just God. No one can blame him for that. You know, he's not punishing people disproportionately or anything like that. It's, there. it's all on them, not on him. But the other view is God still wants people to be saved. Even those who die lost, he still wants them to get saved. He doesn't just save them unilaterally. They still have to repent. They still have to turn to Christ. But, but the view is, who's to say that God can't continue dealing with them after they've died? If, he's really, if he really wants them saved. I mean, maybe he really doesn't, and the Bible's not really, maybe the Bible's using exaggeration or hyperbole when it says he wants everyone to be saved. But if Jesus died for him, here's a part of the argument of Origen's view is that if Jesus died to pay the price for everyone's salvation, now Calvinism does not believe that's so, and I don't say that, that's not, that's not a word against Calvinism, that's just the way Calvinism is. God believes Jesus only died for the elect and not for anyone else. But those who are not Calvinists believe that the Bible says that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He bore the sins of every man and woman and child. He, he's, uh, he, he paid for it all. Now if he did, suppose the devil wins, let's say, 70% of the population because they die in unbelief. And Jesus gets 30% in heaven. Still, that's a big number. But if he paid for all of them and only got 30%, he's a big-time loser. He got cheated. He got gypped. He paid the ultimate price for all the people that he wanted to save and only got you know, a small portion of them. And the devil got the rest. So who's the winner here? Who's the winner in this contest, Jesus or the devil? 
And yet, the Bible continually argues that Jesus is the winner. Jesus conquered Satan. Jesus is, you know, the victor. And that, he, you know, he conquered all his foes and so forth. But if most of them and that he wanted to be in his family end up in the devil's family and, and tormented or whatever, or even, or even annihilated, then he paid for a lot more than what he got. And when people pay for more than what they get, we don't describe them as, you know, winners in that transaction. And again, if Jesus is willing to be the loser, that's fine. That's up to him if he wants to. But there's nobody that says he has to. Again, he set things up the way he wants them. And I sometimes think this way, and I'll tell you this, I mean, I'm open to the second and the third view, both of them, because they both have some merit. Because both of them can be harmonized with the character of God as, as it's declared in Christ. The first view, I no longer think it has any connection with the revealed character of God in the Bible. I believe it's, uh, I believe it's a slander against the character of God that came in with the Catholic Church and, and it was used to keep people in line and keep them loyal to a very unattractive religious system. Uh, but by threatening them even a much more unattractive faith if they aren't loyal to that system. But the, the thing is that, and I'm not here to say that you can't believe the traditional view, I'm just telling my, my journey. I no longer can find any way to harmonize the traditional view held with what the Bible says about who God is and what he wants. And also there's only a handful of verses that can even be pressed into the service of that view, whereas there's a whole lot of verses, you know, to my mind, for the others. Now, what if someone commits suicide? Uh, that's your question. And they're not saved, apparently. <laughs> I didn't forget the question. <laughs> I think, I think that I could tell somebody that we could hope we don't know, but we can hope in the mercy of God, who wants them saved more than we do. This we know. God wants people saved more than they want to be saved and more than we and who love them want them to be saved. Now, who's to say God can't keep working on those that he wants to see saved? Is, is there someone there tying God's hands here? You know, humans do not have the infinite capacity to resist. Some people resist God the whole of 70 or 80 years of their lives and die, but could they resist the dealings of God for a hundred more years? You know, who knows? A thousand more years? Who knows? Who knows how long it would take? If God is determined to, what Jesus said, when one sheep goes away, the shepherd goes out and searches for it until he finds it. And maybe it takes hundreds of years to find and return some of them, but he's not content to lose one. And he searches until he finds it. Now, so that view is based on what Jesus said, and frankly, what the Old Testament says too about about God's love for the for the world and for sinners. And I had a friend who used to call me on the air, and he didn't like the fact that I was even slightly open to this universal reconciliation idea, which is the third view, origin view. And he says, "See, I think that he says I think you've gone soft." Because you have children who've fallen away from the Lord. And now and now you want to be open to universal reconciliation. I said, you know, I think you're probably right. Uh, and anyone who doesn't learn from their experience isn't very smart. Because when I first had my first child, and I've heard people say this, I did not understand until that moment how much God loved me. You know? Until I was a father. I had no conception of what a father's love is for a child. And this is 40, 49 years ago, 50 years ago. And if a man can have a child and not learn anything about the love of God from, from having that love for their child, then that person is more dull than I can imagine. Amen. Now, but even then, I didn't have a rebellious child. For 20-something years, all my kids were seemingly believers. And, uh, and, and so I never had to think this through. But when my children went astray, it was another learning experience for me. I think, what would I do if I were God and he had a wayward child? Now, God doesn't have to do what I do, but he'd be more gracious than I am. 
You know, people say, you can't compare God with you. You're not God. Right, he's a whole lot better than I am. He is love. I know love. I know the love of God. But he is the love of God. He is love. That's who he is. And I know this, that if I were in God's position, and one of my children died, before I could persuade them to come back to Christ, if, if I had the power, which I don't, but God does, if he wants to. If I had the power, I would continue to give them opportunities to repent, even in hell. Now, the Bible doesn't say that God does. So we can't say, ah, oh, the authority of Scripture, we know that people can repent in hell. We cannot say that. But likewise, we cannot say from the authority of Scripture that people don't have that. That's something the Bible doesn't tell us. What it does say, and people usually bring up, you know, uh, Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. I agree. We will die, all people die, and they'll face judgment. But once the judgment is done and the verdict is handed out, we're not told what the verdict is. We know that some are going to go to the lake of fire, but we don't know what's going to happen to them after that necessarily. I mean, maybe some people think they do. The more I've studied the scriptures on this and thought about it, the less I think we know about this. I don't think that God wanted us to be obsessed with hell either in terms of trying to convert people by threatening them, or even using hell to induce us, ourselves, to remain faithful. I've never, I've never, in, in, in deciding whether I'm going to sin or do the right thing, I've never thought about hell. I always think about God. I always think about the love of God, and, and that's what motivates me. Um, and that's what motivated the, the, the prodigal son to come home, the love of his father. So my, my father treats his servants better than this guy whose who's pigs I'm feeding treats me. You know, and remembering the kindness of his father, he said, I'm going home. It's the love of God that draws us. It's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. We love him because he first loved us, not because he threatened us. Now, there are threats. There's plenty of threats in the Bible, and there's certainly threats of punishment in hell after the judgment. What we don't have absolute clarity on, in my opinion, is what that punishment amounts to, what the purpose of it is. It's either so God can just spend all eternity tolerating sin in hell just so he gets the pleasure of torturing people, little bugs, that have the audacity to offend him, uh, which makes him maybe like a medieval tyrant, sort of, I mean, a little bit, maybe that's how the early church, the medieval church thought that makes sense. Or, he's like just a just judge who says, the wage of sin is death, you gotta go, you're done, you're out of here, you don't exist now. Or, he's like Jesus, who said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, you know, and, he, and who gives opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for repentance. We all agree that God gives opportunity after opportunity for repentance until a person dies. What's not agreed on, and we we, we don't have enough information to know whether we can agree on this, but we don't know if he gives them opportunity after opportunity after death. But he might. It just depends on does he really want them saved or not? Or was he just kind of pretending when he said, you know, when he wept over Jerusalem and the fact that they were to be destroyed. When he says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked or I'm, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So this is why I'm up in the air myself. I, don't, I mean, more than one of these views makes sense of the character of God but one of them doesn't seem to anymore. But, so I would just say that if, if someone who's lost an unsaved loved one, say they've committed suicide, or simply died, um, if they're thinking that hell is necessarily a place of eternal torment, then there's no way to comfort them. Because there's, no, there's nothing good to say to them. But God is good. I can say that. And I can say God loves that person more than you do. God sees it as a greater tragedy than you do to lose that person. And I'm not sure God's willing to lose them. You know? He paid an awful price to get them. I'm not sure he's going to let them slip through his fingers very easily. And the Bible does say the interesting thing in Colossians. Uh, there's, I mean, I, I, I need to get on to another question from somebody, but... Uh, <laughs> In Colossians chapter 1, there's an interesting 
juxtaposition of two statements that I find interesting. But in uh, Colossians 1, 15 and 16, Paul says about Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, etc., etc. And then he says, <clears throat> in verse 21, uh, no, not there, verse 19, he says, For it pleased the Father that in Christ all the fullness should dwell, in verse 20, there it is, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now notice he emphasizes in verse 16 that Christ created everything. By him, everything was created, things in heaven and things on earth. And he says, and his purpose is to reconcile all things to himself, things in heaven, things on earth. It looks like it's the same category. The same things he lost is what he wants to get back. The same things he created. He is not willing to be to lose permanently. It sounds like. Now, there are, I, I will say this. Every one of the views, the reason there's a book like this, is because every one of the views of hell has scriptures they use. And every one of the views has answers for the scriptures that the other views are using. This is why I have told people, I don't think I'll ever know which view is true. I don't need to. It's okay not to know. But... Uh, I don't know that I don't know that God wanted to make it uh, unmistakable. I don't know He wanted us focusing on the subject of, of hell. He didn't want us to go there, and he, I don't think He wanted that to be the focus. The gospel is not a message about hell. The gospel is a message about Christ and His Lordship. So uh, I will say this: that the reason I don't think I'll ever really make up my mind is because I know every scriptural argument for each view, and I know the answer that each view would give to the scriptural arguments of the other sides, both of them. And that's because I read almost 40 books from all the different sides while I was preparing this book. And, and so I think, okay, I can make a, a, a strong scriptural case for each of the views. But I know that every verse I use to support it, the other two views have a way of looking at that too, and they, they can fit it in there somehow. And every one of the views has a few verses, at least, that they find very difficult. But, but that's true of almost all theological positions. Whether you're Calvinist, Arminian, dispensational, you know, whatever. Uh, there's going to be a few verses that it, it's not real easy to understand how they fit. But, but I mean, that's just the way theology is. Uh, every, every view of theology has some verses that prima facie seem to be awkward. In, but, but the idea is, with, with this much, as it were, equality, a scriptural weight for each view. I, for me, the deciding factor has got to be cast on the basis of what is the character of God, because all theology is really comes down to this, what is God like, who is God, what is His character, and every every controversial view I think has to be filtered uh, through what do we know about God, and how does this view impact what we know about the character of God. And my question, I think, is going to dovetail or overlap okay. with the security of the believer. Yes. Um, I am not coming at this as a Calvinist, or which I'm not, or, or an Arminian, which I may be more that way. But but I, I do believe in the free will that we have free will, and I do believe that <coughs> faith is not the gift of God, but Jesus is the gift of God. In Ephesians two eight and nine, I've heard you give a explanation of the Greek and so forth and how faith is cannot be the gift of God. Yeah. Jesus is. But as I, I look at so many wonderful promises that people who hold to more of the eternal security view lean on. Mm -hmm. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who pass from death unto life mm -hmm. and all that. And I I believe I understand your view that, that our, if, if your faith is in Jesus, you are secure forever, but, but you are conditionally secure. As long as your faith remains in Jesus. Exactly. Yes. And that is, that's where, even talking about the... Uh, I, know, I know that every one of us has a breaking point, that, you know, humanly speaking. You know, that if you give, give the right situation, 
I don't know who could. I, I mean, we all want to be faithful unto death. Mm -hmm. You know, given given the, the, the history of the church. What if we break under torture? You're saying. Yeah, yeah. We all have our. I think our human breaking point, at least humanly. But that doesn't mean the grace of God wouldn't come and give us what we need at that moment. So, right. Well, Jesus said, "Whoever denies me before men, I'll deny him before my Father in heaven." I always just figured, well, you're done if you deny Christ. Right. But, but Peter denied him three times. Right. But I. And but I'm also part. getting. I'm also kind of. My mind's going into the, the the views of hell. That if I have trusted Jesus and I have remained faithful, but I come to the very end, and somehow physically I just can't take what is being done to me. In my own mind, knowing the character of God and and, and piggybacking off a lot of what you've already said. Mm -hmm. I think I would be okay, but I, I'm not. I'm not trying. I'm just. I grapple with it because I really want to enjoy the security I have in right. Jesus. The Bible says the Lord knows His own. He certainly knows who loves Him and who doesn't. And He's not looking for a gotcha moment, like you know, if if you've been faithful to God all your life and under torture you go crazy and, and say things that you don't mean. Or God knows that. I don't know what He'll do about that. But I, he knows that, you know. It's not like he's saying, well, you've been faithful to me all this time. I know you're my child, but you, you just said those words that are the, you know, that, that you're out. And, and, you know, I think it depends on the sincerity of the person. Peter denied Christ three times. It's, it's unpardonable, but Jesus forgave him, you know. And I think it's because he knew that Peter didn't really mean it. He was just cowardly, you know. Now, I don't plan to deny Christ even under torture if God gives me the grace, and I expect Him to. You know, I mean, I actually, I don't want to endure torture. I don't want to be tortured. But uh, most of my life, I've assumed that could happen here, just like it's happened in communist countries and other, other places where Christians have been tested. I, I've been, that's been very realistic to me from the time I was a teenager. Someday I might have to be tortured for Christ and be faithful. And my determination is, I'll be faithful. Uh, you know, I don't know how, except I trust God to give me the grace. But, you know, people do sometimes, for what reasons I can't say, lapse. There were Christians who lapsed in the second and third century in the torture. Uh, the church didn't want to let them back in, but eventually they found ways to let some of them back in. All I know is, what does God think? What does God want? Well, God is certainly disappointed if we break under, under test. But I've been disappointed with my kids, too, you know. They've done some things very disappointing to me, but, you know, I haven't disowned them, you know. And I can't say what God will do in a case of such extremity as that. I think, even quite apart from the idea of hell, um, and whether hell is a place where there's more chances or not, um, I believe that we evangelicals, at least I, as an evangelical, was raised with the belief, and certainly I held the belief, and taught the belief, that anyone who does not hear the gospel in their lifetime and surrender to Christ in their lifetime, well, it's, it's hell for them. You know, so, of course, this is a strong missionary impetus. You know, these people are going to Christ's grave, millions of people around the world need to go and tell, because if they don't hear, they'll go to hell. Well, maybe they will. I don't know. I mean, but I do know this. That the Bible talks about people in the Old Testament being saved. And they didn't even know the name of Jesus. They didn't know he was going to be crucified. Or they didn't know the gospel as we do. But they had faith in God. They had faith in the light they had. They didn't have as much brilliant bright light as we have in the gospel. But they had some light. And it's, I, I find it significant that in John 1.1, 1, 1, when it talks about Jesus was the word. And then it says... In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then in John 1, 9, it says, This is the true light that enlightens everyone who comes into the world. <clears throat> now, Jesus is the light. And he's, it says he's the true light that enlightens everyone who comes into the world. Now, not everyone has the same amount of light. Some people might only know there's a God because nature tells them so, but they don't know anything else about it. Uh, or they might know more. Or some people might have heard a, a gospel presentation that's somewhat deficient. They might have been, you know, swept into, in their ignorance, into a cult, you know, that, 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 whose doctrines about Jesus are insufficient or, or are wrong. 
uh, or even we who are evangelicals who are quite sure that we're right, who knows how many things we believe about Jesus that we'll have to be corrected about when we see him, you know? <laughs> Uh, you know, not, we know in part, and we prophesy in part, and therefore I don't think God is going to, I don't think what God's looking for is someone who can pass uh, a multiple test, a multiple choice test uh, on theological things. There is value in having correct theology, which is why I want to have correct theology, because the more correct your theology is, the better you know God, and knowing God is a wonderful thing. But some people know him more and some people less. Some people have better and some worse theology. Some may have really bad theology, but their hearts are the same as those who have good theology. They, they want to know the truth. They just... If somebody loves the truth and they're responding to the light that they have, according to John 1, 9, that light is the Word who was later made flesh. He is the true light that enlightens everyone who comes into the world. And I believe that God sees a true response to light on the part of a person as a response, as it were, to Christ. Now that doesn't mean everyone gets the same benefits because there's clearly unique benefits to knowing and serving Christ in this life. Even if I believed, and I can't say that I do, but even if I believe that people who never hear of Christ can end up in heaven, I would still believe they need to hear about Christ so they can fulfill God's purpose for their life. Why should he be deprived? of their service and their love in this life? Why should they be deprived of the benefits of knowing Christ? I mean, even if every person was automatically saved in the world, regardless of what they believe, and I certainly don't believe that, but even if that were the case, there'd still be advantage in knowing Christ. I mean, when I went through my last divorce, I, I remember thinking, how could people without Christ survive this? It's absolutely maddening. It's absolutely, uh, you know, destructive to your to your rationality. It's just so such a crushing thing to go through. Uh, and I know people go through it without Christ. I think how? I mean, it was knowing Christ that made me able to still be victorious through it. Many people are not. They go through it and it's suicide for them, or, or they become drug addicted or alcoholic or something because they don't they don't have Jesus and I, whenever I go through any significant I think how do people handle this without Jesus and usually the answer is not very well if people don't get to know Jesus if we don't preach to Jesus if we don't go to the tribes and, and heathen the world and teach them about Jesus they will live in this miserable life without Jesus and they will never fulfill his purpose that he made them for and then he is deprived. You know, it's, I believe that winning people for Christ should be mainly for God's sake, more than for theirs. I think, I think there's tremendous advantage to the believer to be a believer. I wouldn't want to go a minute without it. But if there's no advantage to believers at all, there's still an advantage to God to be glorified in his creatures. And people who are in bondage to sin, demon-possessed, you know, despondent, uh, hopeless people, they don't bring glory to God. But people who love God back, who receive His grace and they serve Him out of love and obey Him and, and seek to glorify Him in all the ways, which is what being a Christian means, uh, that's good for God. God. That's what God wants. He wants to be glorified in His creation. And if we don't preach the gospel to every nation, there will be people who never have really the opportunity to do that. Even if we concluded that when they die, they get, maybe they're not so bad, they'll go to heaven anyway. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that my focus is not on what happens to people after they die. Right. My focus is on, is God getting what he paid for? Is God getting what he created us for? Is God getting what he wants? Is God pleased? Is God glorified? In my life and in the life of everyone I can influence. If the answer is no, I want to do more to influence them. And I want to reach them all. And I want them to come to Christ. And... Uh, so, when I was younger, it was largely, a, I guess it was maybe the fear of uh, eternal conscious torment in hell uh, that the, I knew I wasn't going to have because uh, I was saved, but, uh, you know, that people will have if they don't get saved. I think that motivated me more than anything else to better get out there and save those people. And it's, it's not a bad motive. I mean, it's at least caring for their souls. That's a good thing. But I realized later that 
it was still a humanistic motive. It was about people, not about God. And my concern has shifted in the past decades to realizing that everything exists for one purpose, and that's for the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. You know, the earth is filled with His glory, the Bible says. Uh, and someday the knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. This is God's <clears throat> desire, that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Now, how does that happen? Through evangelism, discipleship, it's through people giving their lives to God and living for His glory. So Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, he says that God who caused the light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Paul said the knowledge of the glory of God has got to fill the earth someday. We already have it. We've, been, we've received that knowledge of the glory of God. God wants everyone on the planet to have that knowledge of the glory of God and as a result to live for His glory. That's, that's I think, the biblical vision. Uh, and what has happened in, uh, in the evangelical world and long before we were born, long before our parents and grandparents were born, the Christianity became a religion. And what religions are about is getting a better deal in the next life, basically. I mean, you do what you got to do. You do the rituals, you, 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 know, you make the sacrifices, you go through the pilgrimages, or you sleep, you know, lay on a bed of nails. You do what you have to do. Religions are all about being miserable, as miserable as you need to be to guarantee a better life after you die. That's religion, all religions, including the Christian religion. But I don't think Jesus started with it. There, he, there was already a perfectly good religion when he was born. It's called Judaism. There was, but it was corrupted. But it was, it's not like he said, I'm going to start a new religion now. He never mentioned that. He came to start a kingdom where he's the Lord and king and people recognize him as such and, and serve him uh, you know, out of interest to his interest and his glory. So it's, I see the Bible as being about God and about Jesus. Not about me and how can I escape, you know, what I deserve in hell. The question is not how do I escape what I deserve. How do I make sure that Jesus gets what he deserves? That's the issue. And, uh, and what he deserves is to be glorified that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's true. Even if people could go to heaven by the grace of God without knowing him in this life, that's not good enough. Because that's not the purpose of God. The purpose of God is not simply to populate heaven. There's no mention in the Bible of populating heaven. Uh, I mean, when John was caught up in the heaven in, in Revelation 4 and 5, he saw multitudes there and so forth. But that's not referring to at the end of the age. That's, that was in his own time. He was caught up and saw these martyrs and so forth up there and angels and such. But, but the, the purpose of God on earth is that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God like the waters cover the sea. And that's that's our mission. And so, uh, back to your question, what, what if somebody you know, fails God in the end? Well, God, I think God has thick skin. You know, we, we sometimes hear how angry God is. Maybe we've been influenced by Jonathan Edwards and his sinners in the hands of an angry God. Sermon, you know, he's furious. And he hates you, he says. He loathes you as we hate a spider or a detestable creature. That's how God sees you. That's what John from Edward said in his sermon, which influenced the second great awakening and the first one too, actually. And, but that's not really the message in the Bible. The message is not about the wrath of God <clears throat> toward sin. It's about the glory of God that he seeks from his creatures. Now, of course he hates sin because anyone who loves their child hates cancer that's destroyed the child. But then he hates sinners. That's a hard case to make biblically, really. He hates the sin that's in them and wants to cure them of it and deliver them from it. That's what salvation is. But he, he does love his people that he created. He loves his whole creation. Uh, and that's why he wants every day to bow and every time to confess that Jesus is Lord. But it's about, it's all about Jesus. Now, if I fail Jesus, he, he can handle it and I'll, I'll pay a price for it. I don't know what that price will be, but 
I'll accept it. Uh, you know, I'm not really concerned about rewards and punishments. I'm about the glory of God. I want God to be glorified in my life. That's all that motivates me as far as I can tell. Uh, and, you know, if I bring dishonor to him, if I deny him and he sends me to hell, I'll just say, well, I deserve this. You know, you're just. You know, you're, you're a just God. Yeah, but Steve, it still seems like my faith is saving me. And that, that is a work thing that I know there's only one work, and that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But if it's my, if it's my faith that's holding on that will keep me saved, I, I don't think I'm really embracing my Savior. I think I'm embracing my own uh, failings or my own um, vulnerability and fallibility. Well, if we think of our faith as like, uh, it's strictly in terms of it's a condition for my salvation, then we're still thinking about ourselves. What do I have to do to be saved? Oh, just believe? Okay, I'll, I'll do that. How long do I have to believe? Oh, I have to do it all, all my life long? Uh, well, I, I guess it's worth, I'll try that too. But I'm still thinking about how do I qualify for a better life in the next life? Faith to me is believing that Jesus is who he says he is. And that God is who he says he is. And responding to that in a rational manner. If, I mean, there are human beings that I so admire that if I met them, I'd be tempted to venerate them, you know. Uh, I would realize that's wrong. But that's just because of my admiration for them. I, I have to guard against almost being too worshipful to such people. When you know God and you see Him as infinitely greater than those people, Worshiping Him is the only sensible thing. I mean, how could you stop? How could you prevent yourself from worshiping Him if you really believe that He is who the Bible says He is? Now, I realize that Christians often don't spend very much time thinking about that clearly, and therefore we have our struggles and we have our temptations and so forth. But, but uh, believing that He is who He said He is, is what our faith is. And it's, so our faith isn't about us. See, if we're thinking of faith, that's the condition I have to meet in order to, to go to heaven instead of hell. That's still thinking of me. That's all about me, really. It's just that faith is the sacrifice I'm willing to make, or faith is the commitment I'm willing to make to pay the tag for the ticket to heaven. And whereas I believe faith is connectedness with God because you, you can't see Him, so it has to be by faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. <clears throat> But, but knowing Him be, by faith and, uh, and acknowledging Him for all that He is, which results, in my opinion, in love. This is another thing about the, the third view of hell. I think almost everyone I've ever talked to who doesn't believe in Jesus, I think, doesn't know what He's like. And even people who've been evangelized and still reject Him, in many cases, they've been evangelized a certain way, but the church or the Christians that they've been exposed to have not convinced them that that this is true or better by their own lives or whatever. I mean, there's hypocrisy, there's there's things, but I think when someone sees Jesus as He is, I, I mean, maybe some people still want to spit in His face. I, I don't know. Saul of Tarsus, when he finally saw Jesus, and turned them all around. Now, he was persecuted for Christ until then. But when he saw Jesus for who he is, he said, oh, okay, I get it. Now I know who you are. And he was willing to die for Jesus then and to serve Christ and forsake everything and count everything that we had before us dumb for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Uh, I think when someone sees Jesus, even someone who's been a rebel against Jesus, I think at least a large percentage of such people would say, oh, I mean, if, if they see him after death, for example, I think a lot of say, if I if I'd known that, <laughs> I would have wanted to serve you. And and I don't think they'd be saying it because they're trying to escape hell so much. They're just overwhelmed. They think, I wish someone, I wish I'd known that you were like this instead of like the churches said you were, <laughs> or the Christians I knew said you were, mm -hmm. or the you know or the tracts I read said you were. I, I wish I'd known what you were really like. And I remember, I had a friend who had a, a mother who went to church all the time. She was never a believer. She was a lifelong church attender. And I hadn't seen him for years. I saw him and I said, how's your mom doing? He said, well, she's still not with the Lord. But he says, I sometimes wonder if, 
if, if that's her fault or the church's fault, then she goes to it. And I, and I just thought for a moment, you know, a lot of people who are rejecting Christ may not be rejecting Christ. Right. They may be rejecting a, a presentation of Christ that isn't really very much like him at all. I remember Chuck Smith Jr., the son of Pastor Chuck Smith, he said, you know, Paul said he was afraid for the Corinthians that if they would hear of a different Jesus, they might accept him, and that'd be a bad thing. That you might receive a different Jesus. And Chuck Smith Jr. said, I wonder how many people that we know that we think are rejecting Jesus, they're really rejecting a different Jesus that Jesus himself would reject. But they're not seeing Jesus as he is because maybe some flaw in the way we present him, either in our conduct or our message, or other Christians have. We do not know, and only God knows, only God can really answer this, how many people would turn to him instantly and sincerely if they just saw him for the first time the way he really is. Now, I mean, frankly, if there are people like that, I have a hard time imagining that God would say, ah, sorry, snooze, you lose, you die. And, you know, I know you didn't know who I was. I know you're rejecting sort of a false view of me. Now you love me, but ah, you died. Sorry, can't do anything for you. You know, I, I just don't see God as being in that kind of dilemma. I, he wants them saved, but he can't, you know, he can't save them. There are no doubt people who no matter how many opportunities you give them, they still just be nasty toward God, don't want God. And, you know, maybe there's nothing that can be done for them ultimately. But, but I'm just saying that the whole concept of evangelism and salvation and hell that, that I was raised with, I think, I think there was less in Scripture to support it than I thought at the time. And I never suspected that that was so until I specifically set my mind to stay those very issues and to see what other Christians throughout history have thought about those issues and see what, how they interpret Scripture. Like, well, they got a point, you know. So, as far as faith uh, and hanging on in faith, I want to hang on to my faith because I think God will be glorified for that. Um, I also, I, I expect that to, to save me. But uh, it's not my faith that saves me, it's God that saves me. It's Christ that saves me. But my connection to Him is by faith. You know, you mentioned promises to those who are in Christ. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But Jesus said that we were branches in Him and we need to remain in Him. And every branch that does remain in Him produces good fruit. But everyone who does not remain in Him is cut forth and cast forth as a branch. And they wither up and die and they're burned. So, uh, you know, in Christ is a condition that we have to not stop being in. We have to remain in Him. And how is that? I think just by trusting Him. Uh, it says, of course, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace you're saved through faith. So grace is our salvation. The grace of God saves us. But that comes through our faith. And also, in, uh, I think it's in Romans 5, 2, Paul says, in Him we have... Uh, access through faith into this grace by which we stand. Uh, so by our faith we have access into grace. Our faith simply connects us in relationship with Jesus. And through that relationship, grace comes to us, saving us. And uh, as far as you know, losing salvation or whatever, I believe there's something to be lost. Uh, and, and I would, even if I had fully embraced like a total universal reconciliation, you know, that everyone in hell is somebody going to get saved. If I believe that, I would still think there's much to be lost by not following Christ and by not trusting Christ. And, uh, and the greatest loss is that God is not as glorified in my life as he would be if I didn't keep in. you know. Uh, he's, he's, as when I say he's a big boy, he can handle it. You know, he's, I, you know to think that God is so bothered by sin and of course he, he's so disappointed when we sin because he wants us to live holy lives and we want to too but to realize all the things all the sin God sees on a moment by moment basis around the world I mean once in a while we watch these crime shows you know how they solve these murders <coughs> the police, the police, and you hear this horrible thing some horrible disgusting crime that someone did I think and God sees that going on every day around the world I can hardly stand to hear about it one time. 
But God sees it, and He still keeps His composure. You know, He's long suffering. He's not willing that they should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's, you know, yeah, He He does not approve of sin, and we cannot approve of sin either. But it's not like when we sin, God just flies off the handle. I, I can't. I, I just can't handle it anymore. You know, I can't. Why do you sin so much? You know. Uh, I don't think God is flustered. I think God is very majestic, very composed, and very much in charge. And, uh, and disappointed when His creatures do not glorify Him. But not, not set into a frenzy. I mean, when, when, when He saw the earth that all, the, all men's thoughts were only evil continually. And the earth was filled with violence. He said, I have to send a flood. I'm going to just give these people 120 more years to repent. You know? It can't get any worse. Every thought's evil can do. I'm going to still give them 120 years. I can handle it. I can wait. But then I'll have to take them. And I mean, we find God showing such incredible patience with situations that we would not tolerate if we were Him. But we're not Him. Yeah, He's, he's, uh, he's greater than all of us. Uh, yes, Steve. Uh, actually, just a comment, and maybe maybe it's a question too. But something you said earlier um, really got me thinking when you used the scoreboard seventy thirty. I believe it was. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if that's kept score in heaven or not, of course. But I know I know it. But uh, from the all the other things and examples that you said, you know, the, the sheep, the one lamb. Mm -hmm loss, the particle sign, and <clears throat> so forth, I think it's important for us when we're talking to others to not dwell on the masses, but to dwell on the individual. Mm -hmm. Because I think when one person say, that's a victory for Jesus, yeah. I think he won. I don't think he lost at all. I don't think he ever loses. I yeah. think that each individual that comes to him is a victory. Mm -hmm. And, and frankly, even if he annihilates those who reject him, or even if he tortures them forever, he still wins. I mean, he still beats his enemies up. Uh, but there's a really, a really cool paragraph written by uh, William Barclay. You people know who Barclay is? William Barclay? Uh, he was a universalist, a Christian universalist himself. A lot of Christians use his uh, study Bible series. He's very uh, insightful, though. I will admit, I think he, in some ways, he's a little, little more liberal than I am. Uh, but, but that doesn't mean that this is a liberal position necessarily. But he, uh, he wrote this. Uh, where is it? I've got more than one quote from him. Page two fifty. Is it two fifty? <laughs> Yes, that is a good, that, that, I think that is what I was thinking of. He said this, If God was no more than a king or a judge, then it would be possible to speak of his triumph if his enemies were agonizing in hell or were totally and completely obliterated or wiped out. But God is not only a king and a judge. God is a father. He is indeed father more than anything else. No father could be happy while there were members of his family forever in agony. No father would count it a triumph to obliterate the disobedient members of his family. The only triumph a father can know is to have his own family back home. And uh, that, you know, that's a pretty cogent statement. Now, I think many people say, yeah, but that's his family. You know, God has children and the devil has children. The devil's children aren't God's family. But that's not really the way Jesus taught. The prodigal son, when he was serving the devil, and alienated from his father, he was still his father's son. And when he came back, his father said, my son was lost and is now found. My son was dead and is alive. He was a sinner. He represents the tax collectors and sinners that were, you know, apart from God before Jesus came and he called them back. Uh, you know, it's, God, God looks at his whole creation as something that's been marred and destroyed by the enemy. And he sent Jesus to seek and to save what was lost. Uh, and I personally think that Jesus wants to, whether he can or not, remains to be seen, but 
I'm, I'm, I'm doubtful that we can really place limits on what God's allowed to do if he wants to do it. But I think God really wants to restore everything that was lost. And uh, I guess we'll, we'll only know in the next life whether, whether that's what happens or not. But uh, that, that's why a, a great number of evangelicals, frankly, have thought that, you know, Origen might have had a better idea. But well, we don't have to stay on these topics. We can go a different way. Do you want to do it? Yeah, I was going to say, I hate to change the topic, but since yeah. you're... Um, I was raised in the late great planet Earth era, like you, you know. Yeah, and I knew people who wouldn't get married or have they wouldn't get have children because of Matthew 24. Yeah. Oh, to those who... One of those who have children. Yeah, and have to flee. But, you know, years ago I read... Um, Gary to Mars, like her last day's madness, uh -huh. and I've gone through it like three times. And I'm trying to grasp that I'm in the middle of your book about Revelation too. So I I see Matthew 24 now as mostly leading up to you know Jesus' warning and his contemporaries about what's going to happen uh -huh. when the Romans surround Jerusalem. So I'm wondering when when I see the term last days, mm -hmm. like I'm going to go home to a word study. Are we talking about the last days before the end of the age, which is the end of the, the current age. age before the Messianic age? So when the apostles use the term last days, is it the last days before the kingdom is inaugurated, or is it the last days before the second coming, before Jesus returns, or is it both? I mean, if, if I do that word study, right. what am I going to find? First of all, I want to say that Gary DeMar in Last Days Madness goes a little further than I do into this. He sees some things as about 70 AD that I, that I don't, but he's not a full credit, uh, and that's good. Um, but, yeah, I, I looked into that question myself some years ago, obviously, when, we were, when I began to think in creditistic terms about some passages. What I concluded... Well, I'll tell you, before I knew anything about what happened in 70 AD or that that was important or anything in my Christian life, I always had come to believe shortly after the Hal Lindsey era, you know, when I, be, when I ceased to be dispensational, I, I came to believe that the last days, simply for the whole church age, from the time Jesus came the first time until the end of the age, that these about 2,000 years are the last days. And uh, I found there were a lot of scholars who thought that, too. Although I, I, I kind of reached that conclusion tentatively, and I was pleased to find others who thought that. Um, and, and the reason was because it was very clear that all the writers of the New Testament said they were living in the last days. So I thought, well, the last days certainly must go till the second coming of Christ, because I didn't know anything about 70 AD in those days. Uh, so they were in the last days. Peter said, this is what's Joel prophesied, in the last days I'll pour my spirit as at Pentecost. Paul said, uh, you know, these things served as examples for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Uh, John says, little children, it is the final hour. And as you've heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the final hour. Uh, you know, James said, he's rebuking the rich people in his day, saying, you have heaped up treasures for yourself in the last days. Uh, it's like virtually uh, Peter in First Peter chapter one says Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but in these last days has been manifested, meaning at his first coming. And Hebrews begins with these words in Hebrews one: God, who in sundry times and diverse places spoken to our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken through his Son. Obviously referring to the first coming of Jesus. So I found that. All these, everyone who wrote New Testament books spoke of their own times as the last days. I thought, well, that was the beginning of the church age, so I guess the whole church age is the last days. When I came to understand uh, how significant AD 70 was, I realized that <clears throat> these people were literally living in the last days of the Jewish age, <coughs> which had been going on for 1,400 years. And I, I, I remember thinking, well, I always thought that 2,000 years, that is the whole church age, is a long time to call the last days. It's in contrast with the 4,000 years before Jesus came. That's been like half as long as that already since he's come. And to call that the last day, you, you, you think you'd call that the last centuries or the last something bigger than days. But if you're talking about an era that started at Moses 
and ended with the destruction of the whole Jewish system permanently in AD 70, then 30 AD to 70 AD, those really are the last days of that era. And so I have come to think, though again, I, what I think is not, it's not obligatory for anyone else to think what I think. Uh, and I would trust people to do their own research before they settle on this, but I have come to think that at least in most cases, it's talking about the last days of the, of the temple, of, of the Jewish era. Because they certainly were living in the last days of that. And, and they knew it because Jesus said that the temple was going to be destroyed and that that generation would not pass until it happened. So, you know, I, I believe that in most of the cases, if not all, last days means the last days of the Jewish order. Now, there's maybe one or two places in Paul's later epistles, like in the pastoral epistles, where he says, in the last days, perilous times will come, and men will be lovers of self more than lovers of God, and, you know, all, all these bad things in First Timothy 4. Um, I guess I just... By default, I've always seen that as sort of the last days of the world, you know. But I even suspect that's probably talking about the last days of the temple order, but I'm not sure. Because certainly the disciples knew, well I shouldn't say certainly because full prayers would deny this, but I believe it's clear. The disciples knew there were two things prophesied in, in, the, in the future from their time. One was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And two would be the second coming of Christ at the end of the world. Not the last days. Well, it, well, it could be the last days of either, depending on which ones they're thinking of. You know, if they're thinking in terms of the nearness of the end of Jerusalem, which I think many of these passages were, then the last days would simply refer to the period from their time till the destruction of Jerusalem. If they're thinking of that other prediction of the second coming of Christ at the end of the world, they might in that context speak of the last days as you know the last days before that event but i have to say i don't know of any place where it's absolutely clear that that's what they're doing i i leave open that possibility because i can't think of any reason to exclude that possibility but uh i tend to see the last days in the new testament as a reference to the last days of the of the second temple of judaism talk about that shift Matthew 24, where... Yes, and that's another, I think I disagree with Gary DeMar. Matthew 24, you know, has the all of it discourse, the discourse that Jesus gave on the Mount of Olives, starting out with him predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, not one stone of the temple would remain standing on another, it would all be thrown down. The disciples came to him and said, when shall this be? What sign will there be that's about to take place? And he gives an answer, which we call the all of it discourse. This answer is found in Luke 21, in Mark 13 and in Matthew 24. And in all three of those accounts, it leads up to a point, which in Matthew is verse 34, where it says, this generation will not pass before all these things come to pass. Which is, of course, talking about the temple's destruction. Then he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And I believe that's at the point that Mark and Luke leave off. They don't go further. Matthew does. Matthew has like twice as much material after that than he included before. It. And he takes that statement, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away, which is probably the last statement that Jesus made on the Mount of Olives. And Luke, I mean, Matthew takes material from another discourse that Jesus gave on another occasion, which is recorded in Luke 17. And he tags that off to make the seemingly the all of the discourse really long. Although we know that the material after that point is actually taken from a different discourse. And that shouldn't be strange because Matthew does that. Uh, Matthew has five uh, inflated discourses of Christ that he, they're kind of uh, like a composite thing where Jesus is talking about something and, and Luke, uh, Matthew will bring in something from Luke or Mark from a different context and tag it on there as if Jesus said it all in one place. The Sermon on the Mount, for example. In Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount is three chapters long. In Luke, it's half one chapter. Well, why is it so long in Matthew? Because Matthew includes things that Jesus said on other occasions, not on the Mount, that are recorded in other places in Luke and in Mark that aren't the same thing, but he brings it in and he makes 
you know, he makes basically a big discourse, including a lot of things Jesus said on different occasions on the same subject. And it would appear that Matthew has tagged onto the all of the discourse material from a different discourse that's recorded in Luke 17. That's the one that talks about one should be taken and the other left. It'll be like the days of Noah, you know. And it seems to me hard to get away from the idea that that is talking about the end of the world. Whereas up to the point where he said this generation won't pass before all these previous things he's talking about take place, that I believe is answering the question of when will Jerusalem be destroyed. But when he says heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away, Jesus, Matthew just says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. What day and hour? I believe he's transferred from AD 70 to heaven and earth passing. When, when heaven and earth pass away, no one knows when that's going to be. And he goes on to talk about that. It's from a different discourse. Well, I believe Jesus was talking about a different subject. That is, in Luke 17, I believe Jesus was talking about the end of the world. And in Luke 21, the other discourse, he's talking about the end of the Jewish era. But Matthew's tagged them on together. Not saying that they're talking about the same thing, but transitioning from the one to the other by the statement, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. Now that's actually the end of the Olive Discourse. But having mentioned heaven and earth passing away, I think Matthew says he's going to take this material Jesus talked about about the end of the world, which is when heaven and earth pass away. And he's going to say, he's going to add that to no one knows when that's going to happen. You know, the first thing's going to happen in this generation, I can tell you that. But as far as the heaven earth passing, no one, even I, Jesus, even I don't know that. The angels don't know, the Son doesn't know, only the Father knows that. And so I believe that at about verse 36 of Matthew 24, we have changed from talking about 70 AD to talking about the last days, although the term the last days are not used in the passage. But what, what you're asking about the, the things leading up to the second coming of Christ. So I believe that Matthew's version of the Olive Discourse has both subjects. The first part is the Olive Discourse, which is about 780. And the latter part is from other things Jesus said elsewhere about his actual second coming. And that confused me. Actually, this, uh, even if you're not interested in full prayers, I have two chapters on the Olive Discourse in this book that actually explain that and go into the details. Yeah. So in that section of Matthew, he is talking about some judgment. After verse 36, I believe. Yeah, so, so his judgment, what judgment would that be if we're not talking about 70 AD? Well, the second coming of Christ, the final judgment. The final. Yeah, when Jesus comes back, he's going to raise the dead, and he's going to judge everyone according to their words. And some will go, as the, the story of the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25 is about that too. You know, the, the, the sheep go into eternal life, and the goats go into eternal judgment or punishment, I think it is. Now, by the way, the eternal punishment sounds an awful lot like the traditional view of hell, and it's one of the favorite verses on the subject, but the other two, ver the other two versions have, each of them, a reasonable explanation that has a lot to do with the meaning of eternal in the Greek. Uh, I have a whole half a chapter mm -hmm. on the meaning of, of eternal in Greek, if I help them. But, um, uh, to make a long story short, the Greek word translated eternal is a more generic word for long-lasting. On occasion, it does refer to eternal, but many times in Scripture, it doesn't. Uh, like when talking about the, the everlasting hills of Jerusalem, the everlasting doors of the gates of the city, or uh, in, in the Old Testament where it talks about the slave who, after seven years, is offered his release, but he doesn't want to, so he gets his ear pierced and he serves forever. You know, well, not for eternity, certainly, but for a long time. And... Uh, Anyway, there's even the word uh, even the word punishment is seen differently in some past, uh, by some uh, or yeah, punishment. The word colossus in the Greek can be translated correction. But uh, anyway, I don't want to go into all that because that's technical and you need the background of what I've discussed before. So Jason. in that case, how can we know our life is eternal? It's used like that's in the question. same way there. That's a good question. If the word eternal doesn't always mean endless, and it doesn't. I mean, all Greek scholars agree, even the most conservative evangelicals, 
If you look in any lexicon, it makes it very clear. You look up Ionius, which is the word translated eternal, and they say, well, uh, everlasting or long lasting, or, you know, and then they say, you know, uh, you know continuing either in the past or the present uh, beyond the point of uh, seeing the end, you know, it's like beyond the vanishing point. But they say it doesn't necessarily mean everlasting. So, how then do we know that our eternal life is everlasting? Well, because that's not the only word we have for it. We have a statement by Jesus that whoever believes me will never die, for example. Uh, we have the word immortality, you know, used that he gives immortality to those who believe in him. So there's, there's a, it's true that the word eternal life, if that's the only phraseology we had about it, would maybe leave it open to question of whether eternal that in that case means endless, literally endless, or just a very, very long time. But we have other passages that use, use different language that is not so flexible. You know, Ionius, the Greek word Ionius, is indeed uh, ambiguous, and it's used in many connections in the Bible, even uh, you know, where things are not. I mean, I have, like I said, there's a half, half a chapter in this book about Ionius, about the word everlasting. Um, and I, you know, I quote all the lexicons and scholars and give examples and so forth. But, um, but immortality, that's not a, that's not a uh, ambiguous word, you know. And so we can know that our eternal life is literally endless, you know, because there's, more than one way that is stated in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm just going to ask Felix to tell everybody how he stumbled on the radio program. Oh, I guess that's right. Have it's you... just a cute story I thought I would really appreciate. It's not long, but... No, it's not. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah some may say it's, it's, it's maybe coincidence or what have you, but uh, I, I have a different view. But basically, um, I have a very old truck, it's a 1999 truck. I drive to work every day. It's about a year ago, my radio went out. This would not play. There's, I turn on, try to turn on, try to turn off. It's because you were listening to the wrong stuff, right? <laughs> well, I don't know if that's true. I only listen to uh, primarily uh, talk radio, and sometimes I listen to Christian stations on the FM station. Uh, and that's pretty much it. But you know, like I said, it went out only, I bang on it. Constantly, it just would not play. And then maybe it's it seems like it would work. It just hit hard enough. <laughs> it did. Did you try it with jackhammer? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a few weeks later, I was just driving to work and then just driving home from work. It just came on. <laughs> I, I didn't touch it. It didn't do anything. It just came on. And it came on to a Christian radio station here in Denver on the AM station, which I never listened to. Mm -hmm. It happened to you. <laughs> and that's how I got introduced to you. I've been listening to you ever since. And it, it comes on automatically now by itself. <laughs> I can't turn it off. I can't change the channel. <laughs> but, but it stays on the station consistently. And I can't change the channel. And it only comes on at 2 at, at 3 o'clock. Right? Well, no, it's all, like, it plays all the time now. <laughs> Uh, like I said, some would say it's just coincidence, but I say it's ordained because <laughs> God wanted me to do your work. Uh, and you know, I'll tell you, Steve, you really have changed my life, uh, and I've learned a lot from you. And uh, now that I have four, I can ask a question. But there's some things that I, I have I struggle with, and, and I've listened to your lectures on healing. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm, I'm there yet. Uh, I think the Lord is still giving me revelation, but um, I guess the question is, what do you say to a sibling um, who's dying of cancer? And, and you know, your, your lectures talk about that healing is a gift mm -hmm. and that it's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. But then I listen to other pastors like Cliff O'Dollar, uh, Kenneth Copeland, you know, and Cliff O'Dollar, I don't know if you're Are they on the same station with me? No. <laughs> 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 but I don't know if you've ever heard of Cliff O'Dollar. Oh, yeah. 
he, uh, he had prostate cancer and he believed for healing and he received it. Uh, I have prostate cancer. I believe, and, and God didn't believe me. Supernatural. I had to go through. It always seems to work for those guys. Right. And I, and I don't understand that, but but I struggle with that. Okay. And I kind of I kind of struggle with my faith with that. Sure. Uh, but again, my sister who's dying of cancer. I don't I don't know how to pray for her. Yeah. How do you how do you suggest we do that? Before I answer, have do you listen to my lectures on the Word of Faith teaching? Yes. Okay. Because those guys you mentioned are Word of Faith teachers. Right. And. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a lot of them, Word of Faith teachers, have been healed, or at least they say they have, and I'm not, I won't doubt their testimony. I mean, I haven't known all of them to be exemplary for their honesty or their uh, refusal to exaggerate, but uh, but I can accept that they may have been healed, because I believe healing happens, uh, supernatural healing happens. I, I know of somebody who was uh, healed of, of cancer it was through her whole body, and she totally unexpectedly. Which was interesting because she didn't believe she'd be healed. Uh, she, in fact, told us God had told her she was going to die and what day she was going to die. She had cancer through her whole body. She was bedridden when I met her. She was a young woman in her 30s with two little kids and a, a fine husband. And yet she was radiant and joyful. I'm ready to meet Jesus. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. And God told me I'm going to die. It's going to be this day. Well, that day came and she was healed. She didn't ask to be healed. She didn't want to be healed. She didn't even want people to pray for her to be healed because she wanted to go see Jesus. She said, don't pray for me. She says, I'm going to die. God told me I'm going to die. Well, he, he didn't tell her she was going to die. She was mistaken of that. But she certainly wasn't confessing her healing. You know, she was confessing her death and she got healed. So God does heal, but not on the basis that the Word of Faith teachers say. In other words, they say anyone can be healed as long as they speak the word of faith as long as they have the faith and say so and their view is you will have what you say if you say you're sick you're going to be sick if you say you're healed you're going to be healed now the Bible doesn't teach any of that that's, that's putting magic into the mouth of uh, people and it's not really a Christian doctrine I know they have verses everyone has verses for their doctrines no matter how cultic they are the Jehovah's Witnesses have verses the Mormons have verses they're not good use of them but, but they can quote them and the same thing, uh, I used to read Kenneth Hagin every day when I was a teenager. I, I loved you know, his books. Uh, and I thought he was right because I was a teenager. And uh, I just haven't studied the Bible that well. But I gave up that view as soon as I did study the Bible better because I realized that the verses he was using were simply taken out of context and were not, I mean, they were, they seemed to work well for what he was trying to get across. What he was getting across was not agreeable with Scripture in general. And, uh, if you're dying of cancer, you've got a friend or loved one who's dying of cancer. All I can say is uh, people die. Of, you know, I would say sadly, but not not terribly sadly. If, you know, if they're Christians, I mean, it's, it's to die is gain, and to, to live is Christ. Uh, we hate to lose loved ones, but if they love the Lord, they're not hating it. You know, once they get there, I mean, they, all, almost everyone would like to die suddenly in their sleep, of course, and rather than waste away with some disease. But we don't get to make that choice. That's, you know, God decides what trials he'll test us with and, and, uh, and, and what way we'll die. You know, it says in, in John chapter 21 when Jesus is talking to Peter about how he's going to die. You know, he says when you're young, you, you uh, dressed yourself and you went where you wanted to go, but when you're old, men will bind you and take you where you don't want to go and they'll stretch you out. And, and John says, yeah, that's, that was Jesus predicting how Peter would glorify God in his death. Uh, not just how he'll die, but how he'll glorify God in his death. And, and God intends for all of us to glorify him in death. And all. If we had the choice, we'd all just stay healthy until the moment we take our last breath in our sleep and find ourselves in the presence of Jesus. But lots of Christians have been eaten by lions, hacked up by gladiators, you know, uh, tortured in prison, Communist China and, and Communist you know, Eastern Europe. Uh, Christians have had to suffer very many things. And even the Word of Faith people argue that we do have to suffer persecution, but that we don't suffer su uh, healing, sickness. But there's nothing in the Bible that says that we don't have to suffer sickness. Uh, true, the Bible teaches that God heals when He wants to, but He actually forgives us when we do something. 
but he heals when he wants to. It's, it's, it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Why is that just to forgive us our sins? Because Jesus purchased that. And for God to withhold what was purchased on our behalf would be unjust. In a sense, God owes it to Jesus to forgive us because Jesus paid that price. But Jesus didn't pay for our healing. And therefore, and that's contrary to what Creflo Dollar and Kenneth Copeland say. They say, oh, he, he, he paid for our forgiveness and for our healing. Well, if that's true, then God owes us that too because it's paid for. It's, you know, it's been paid on our behalf. Um, we, we, when we got to town, one of the people in this room had actually uh, rented a hotel room for my wife and me to stay very graciously and generously. When we showed up, I didn't have to show my credit card at all. We just said, oh, paid for it, so we went to our room. Now, in a sense, they owed us that room. The person who paid for it didn't owe it to us. But once the hotel was paid, on our behalf, it was owed to us by the hotel. Uh, because otherwise it's cheating the person to pay for it. And, and same thing, if Jesus paid for our sins to be forgiven and our sicknesses to be healed, then for God to withhold healing or forgiveness would be unjust because it's been paid for and it can't be withheld. But the Bible talks about God forgiving our sins as a matter of justice. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins, but it never speaks of his healing as a matter of justice, as if it's owed. It, Paul had a friend named Trophimus who was sick. He left him sick in, in Miletus. He had a friend named Epaphroditus who got sick. He did recover, but he almost died, Paul said. And he said, he, we almost lost him, but he says, but God had mercy on him. Now, mercy and justice are different things. Mercy is not something owed. Paul didn't think that God owed it to Epaphroditus to heal him. It was a mercy that God healed him. Uh, Oh, is it that late or Okay. Um, so God heals when he when he feels that will most glorify him. And I I I give this example a lot of something that Jesus didn't heal, uh, although he was requested, and that's Lazarus. Lazarus was sick, uh, almost dead, and his sisters sent messages to Jesus by implication that please come and heal him. He said, you you know, the one you love is sick. And, and they were angry that Jesus didn't come because that's what they were implying. We expect you to come and heal your friend. And Jesus didn't. He said, this sickness is not unto death, but unto the glory of God. And then when Lazarus actually died, and Jesus did go down there, Martha said, if you'd come, my brother would not have died. And Jesus said, I told you, if you believe, you'll see the glory of God. Now, he didn't heal Lazarus, but he raised him from the dead, which was even, in some ways better. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's a bigger, bigger miracle. Maybe a little better. Well, better in this sense. Jesus said to his disciples, Lazarus died, and he says, I'm, and I'm glad I was not there so that you might believe. He knew that if he'd been there, he would have healed him, and the disciples said, oh, there's another healing. You know, <laughs> there's just another healing. But by raising from the dead, it was a much bigger impact, you know. So it was better for him to raise him from the dead, although from the standpoint of the sisters, they had to go through more suffering, not knowing he was going to raise but the point is that God sometimes has a better idea. We, when we are sick or someone we love is sick, we can't imagine any better idea than to heal them. You know, I mean, why wouldn't God heal them? Well, he might have a better idea. He did with Lazarus. And I believe he has with many, many people. Uh, I, I often think of Johnny Erickson Todd. I don't know if you know who she is. She's a young, well, not young, she's old now, but when she was young, she was in a diving accident, got paralyzed from the neck down. She'd been in a wheelchair ever since. Uh, she's also a, more recently a cancer survivor. But, but she, uh, you know, she has been a tremendous testament for Christ. She's got a radio program. She's got a ministry to disabled people. She's, there's a book, a best-selling book written about her. There's a movie made about her. Billy Graham had her on his platform giving her testimony. She's, if she hadn't injured herself, she'd be an unknown person. But God glorified himself through her disability and gave her a platform, and, and as you know, I'm sure many people have been saved through her testimony, who would never have heard of her if she hadn't had this set of circumstances that kind of propelled her into disability. But God, she'd never been healed. People have prayed for her to be healed, but she hasn't gotten healed. But she 
she accepts it. I mean, she just figures this is God's will. Um, and, but the word of faith, people, that you should never accept sickness as God's will. Why not? Well, they say because Jesus paid for it. The Bible does not say he paid for it. That's the thing. They, they use a couple of verses. Isaiah 53, verse 5, especially. Uh, that with his stripes we're healed. They say, see, by Jesus' stripes, he purchased our healing. It doesn't say by his stripes he purchased our healing. He says, we are healed. And the healing that is spoken of there is the healing of the disease of the nation that is mentioned throughout Isaiah. Prior to that, Isaiah has mentioned the nation is sick, like a sick man from head to toe, full of putrefying sores, and no physician has been there to wrap up the wounds. So metaphorically, the nation is under the judgment of God and taking a beating from God, but not no one's there restoring them to God. And, and this alienation from God is, is treated as this national sickness through many passages in Isaiah. And finally, you get to Isaiah 53, it says, but by the Messiah's stripes, we're healed. Now, that verse is quoted by Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2. I think it's verse 24 or 25, something like that. And he says, he quotes Isaiah 50, he says, By his stripes you were healed. He says, For you were like sheep going astray, but you've now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your soul. Now that's also from Isaiah 53. He says, All we, in Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. So Peter says, You were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned. You've been reconciled. You, you're, you're no longer alienated. And he says, By his stripes you were healed. Because you were going to strike, now you've returned. What's healed is the relationship. Uh, in, the, in the poetry of the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah, uh, Hebrew poetry is characterized by parallel lines, uh, the repetition of the same idea twice or more. And in that passage it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Now those two statements mean the same thing. But they're parallel. That's typical Hebrew poetry. It says the same thing twice. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. That's the same as wounded. For our iniquities, which is the same as our transgressions. Okay? Those lines are equal in meaning. The next two lines are, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, stripes are parallel to chastisement. Chastisement is the beating of a disobedient son or slave or something that lives stripes. I know it sounds barbarous, but that's that's how they understood it in those days. You discipline that way. So the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were healed. So the chastisement and the stripes are the same. The healing is our peace with God. He was chastised for our peace. His stripes have brought healing of what? Our alienation from God. We're at peace with God again. So the, the whole meaning of Isaiah 53, 5 is uh, figuratively they talk about the nation's sickness. And Isaiah is not the only prophet that does that. Both uh, Jeremiah and Hosea also speak about God saying, I will heal their backsliding. Now the word heal is the same word used for healing sicknesses, but it's their backslidings. It's their, it's their distance from God that needs to be repaired. They need to be brought back to God. The, the healing is in the relationship not in their organic sicknesses in their bodies. So these are not promises of physical sickness, but the Bible does make it clear that Jesus heals when he wants to, when God wants him to. Jesus didn't heal everybody in Galilee, but he healed everyone in some towns, and he healed a lot of people, and he could heal everybody, but he left a lot of people sick because the apostles ran into a lot of sick people shortly after Jesus left in the same territory where Jesus had been ministering. So Jesus didn't heal everybody, uh, he healed widespread, but the healings he did, the Bible indicates, were signs that were done to confirm his word, uh, that the kingdom was being introduced at that time, and the, the signs following were the ways that confirmed it. And, and God still heals, but he doesn't heal every time we want him to. And it, it is a point that a man wants to die. And frankly, again, I'm sure if we had our choice, we'd all die in our sleep. Uh, painlessly, uh, like you may have heard, you know, statement. You know, when I die, I want to die like my grandfather did, <laughs> peacefully in his sleep. 
I'm not not, like, this plan not like the pass not like his passengers who are screaming in terror. <laughs> <laughs> what I was gonna say, Steve, is I prefer to leave this planet alive like what's this long as four sixteen. Well that'd be nice. And you know, every Christian who's ever lived would like to have done that, and most of them didn't. And some of them living may or may not. We you know we we've been told for many, many decades that you know Second coming of Christ is very imminent, and uh, we don't have any idea. But you're right. I mean, who would rather go alive? Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can hope for the rapture, but prepare to die. <laughs> you know, prepare to meet your God, one way or the other. Uh, which, which for a Christian is healing? Um, yeah. Hey, listen, so, we need to wrap okay. it up. We're past the time that we were given. But uh, I checked, and we can mill around and chat for just a few minutes. Yeah, I want you guys to visit with each other, too, not just have Q&A. So, so please visit with each other for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, but we really do need to uh, respect that we only have room until 8.30, technically. So. And, and there may still be some water. And, and and thanks again to, to Sarah and Russ for setting, setting us up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.